other cerulean birds. That means blue, by the way. We've locked up villains from Disney, Pixar, and DreamWorks, so how about we get to our Blue Sky Studios docket? Although they aren't as well known as the aforementioned studios, Blue Sky still put out a fair amount of beloved films and franchises for nearly two decades, and some of those movies had some great villains to boot. Now join us as we chronicle the antagonists of Blue Sky's first decade and decide what fates suit them the most. I'm Keefe Nosi with Wicked Binge, and this is Sentencing Blue Sky Villains for Their Crimes, Part 1. <laughs> Let's start things off at the beginning with Blue Sky's first film, the original Ice Age. Our very first villain is the saber-toothed tiger, Soto. The leader of the pack that Diego originated from, Soto was also the deadliest and strongest of the group. After a large chunk of said pack was wiped out by humans, Soto becomes infatuated with the idea of revenge against them. He's primarily focused on kidnapping and eating Roshan, the tribe's youngest child. It had better be alive. That motivation alone makes him guilty of attempted kidnapping and murder. Starting things off strong today, aren't we? He tries again to commit murder after Diego leaves the group as he sees this decision as an act of betrayal. One of the most dangerous predators to come from the prehistoric days, Soto's not to be toyed with and due to his crimes, gets 10 years in prison. He could have gotten a worse sentence, but because he ultimately fails at all that he tries to accomplish, we'll spare him in this case. Hey, it's better than going extinct, that's for sure. We're finishing off Soto's pack by looking at Zeke, Oscar, and Lenny. These guys are pretty one-dimensional, so we think that it makes sense to try them all at once. In terms of characterization, think of them like the hyenas in The Lion King. Like them, they're totally obedient to their leader, and they're also where a lot of the film's comic relief comes from. <laughs> <laughs> in regards to the crimes this trio commits, they are first and foremost guilty of aiding and abetting Soto in his quest for vengeance. Beyond that, all three of them also attempt to murder Diego after he leaves the pack. While they're not as prominent in the film as Soto is, these three manage to have the same criminal charges that he got, showing once again how loyal they are to their leader. This means they all get the same amount of time in prison, right? Well, not exactly. Since they aren't as threatening nor as determined as Soto is, we'll hold off on giving them the same sentence he got. Instead, these guys will be enjoying a sentence of five years in the slammer, half of what Soto got. The fact that they lack the level of threat Soto has manages to be their salvation, as it's what would have easily gotten them the same amount of prison time he earned. Sometimes it's actually good to be a bit underachieving. That's what I tell my parents, anyway. I mean, you never know when doing so will help save your skin. We're moving on from prehistoric times to the age of robots, with the next film on our list, 2005's Robots. First to stand here is the head of Big Weld Industries, Ratchet. Once the right-hand man to Big Weld himself, Ratchet overthrew him in an effort to gain more control of Robot City. That already means this robot is guilty of corruption. Following this, his primary goal shifts to getting rid of all outdated robots so that they can be replaced by upgrades. Why be you when you can be new? He wants these older models gone no matter what, showing that attempted genocide is indeed one of Ratchet's most grievous offenses. In the film's final battle, he not only tries to dispatch Rodney and his comrades, but he also attempts to melt Big Weld down to make way for his new robots. This adds both attempted murder and torture to an already morbid set of crimes. A robot obsessed with upgrades and his legacy, Ratchet is the worst kind of businessman and a real danger to his community, to say the least. Considering the fact that he tried to wipe out nearly everyone in the city, the most appropriate punishment for this fellow is, unfortunately, for him, the death penalty. Ratchet's crimes are just too horrific to let off lightly, and this punishment is easily the most appropriate considering the severity of his actions. We hope he enjoys the chop shop, because he'll be a permanent resident of it very soon. While he might be the main antagonist of the film, Ratchet isn't acting alone in his evil plans. In actuality, he's acting on behalf of his mother and Big Weld's rival, Madame Gasket. Gasket's the one technically responsible for the many crimes Ratchet commits in the film. She's the one who helped Ratchet take over Big Weld Industries, and she's also pushing for upgraded robots just like Ratchet is. Hi, great time. Time's over. Chop, chop. As such, many of Ratchet's crimes carry over to her. Just as he participated in attempted genocide and corruption, so does she. Because of this, we feel it makes the most amount of sense if she, like her son, is given the death penalty. While Madame Gasket might not be as active in the film's plot as Ratchet is, she is still the mastermind of it all, so it seems appropriate that she be given the same punishment he got. It looks like the chop shop will be getting another customer. Hey, can we get a table for two? We now return to the world of Ice Age as we explore the villains of its sequel, The Meltdown. Starting off with one of the more one-note villains Blue Skies created, the armadillo known as Fast Tony. Fast Tony is a con man, nothing more and nothing less. In an era full of deadly predators, Tony wants little more than to survive, and he'll do anything to save his own skin. Yes! I am. With much of the ice around the land beginning to melt, Fast Tony uses this as a means to con people, offering items with the false promise that they will save them from the area's flooding. Apart from that, however, Fast Tony doesn't have nearly the assortment of offenses as prior villains have had. Because of that, we give Fast Tony only one year in the doghouse. Since his only crime was conning people, a crime he wasn't even all that good at doing, we don't think it's worth it to give him an extremely lengthy sentence. Besides, Tony doesn't seem like the type of fellow to learn from his mistakes, so realistically, it'll only be a matter of time before he ends up here again. Time to look at the far 
deadlier pair of villains this film has to offer, the sea reptiles known as Cretaceous and Maelstrom. Like any vicious predator, these two are motivated by the need for food, and in this film, Manny and the rest of the gang just so happen to end up on the menu. This makes Cretaceous and Maelstrom guilty of attempted murder, but unlike some of their predecessors, these two have been successful on some level. It's heavily implied in the film that they've eaten their fair share of mammals, and they even snack on Tony's sidekick Stew shortly after they make their introduction. Easily the most dangerous villains in the Ice Age franchise so far, even if neither one has a single line of dialogue, these villains are more than deserving of the death penalty. We can't exactly realistically judge how the death penalty would be carried out for beings who lived in prehistoric times, but judging by the savagery of that era, it'll be anything but quick and painless. It's time to take a detour to the world of Dr. Seuss as we look at the foes of Blue Sky's fourth animated film, Horton Hears a Who. First to the stand here is Jane Kangaroo, otherwise known as the far more appropriate sounding Sour Kangaroo. Your average cynical stick in the mud, Jane hates nothing more than Horton's constant discussion about the Who's who live on a speck that Horton possesses. She becomes determined to steal the speck and destroy it, putting an end to Horton's fantasy. Give me that clover, Horton. With just this one goal, she becomes involved in both theft and attempted genocide, even if she doesn't believe that that would be the case. And you probably thought Ratchet and Gasket would be the only ones guilty of that, didn't you? Well, much like those two, Sour Kangaroo will be sentenced to death. While yes, she is redeemed at the end of this film, does her saying sorry really absolve her of nearly wiping out an entire civilization? Oh, we don't think so. Who knows how this penalty will be enforced, but we're sure the Who's have something special planned for her. The second and final villain to come from this film is simply named Vled Vledikov, a vulture hired by Sour Kangaroo to capture the Speck, Vlad is guilty of the same crimes that she committed, but is a lot more ruthless. I've got you now, elephant. Trust us when we say that this is one vulture you don't want to mess with. Since he partakes in the same crimes as his boss and doesn't even get the chance at redemption that she got, can we really give Vlad here anything other than the death sentence? Vlad Vladikov has all the negative qualities that Jane had and even less of a conscience. This one's a no-brainer. Everyone, make way for the dinosaurs as we get ready to look at the third Ice Age installment, Dawn of the Dinosaurs. Unlike previous installments, there's only one villain to look at here, and it's the albino baryonyx, Rudy. How fearsome is this dinosaur? He's the ruler of all dinosaurs, so that should tell you something about how imposing he is. More than anything else, Rudy wants to become the king, and he'll go to great lengths to make that title his. He has his sights set on taking out Mama, as she's the only one standing in the way of him becoming king. That means that this dinosaur is guilty of attempted murder and attempted usurpation. He also tries to kill again when he wants to kill the explorer Buck for his tooth. Rudy's crimes of attempted murder and usurping power could very easily give him the death penalty, but there are a few things that get him out of a severe punishment like this. For one, while he can be threatening, Rudy's a villain who's played more for laughs, which does dampen the ability to see him as a genuine threat. Secondly, he does end up becoming more of a friendly rival to Buck than a straightforward nemesis, showing that he does atone for at least one person he's endangered. As a result of this, we're giving Rudy five years in prison. This dinosaur got off rather lucky, if you ask us. If he were a bit more intimidating, he'd probably be going out the same way as all the other dinosaurs. It's time to wrap up this party by looking at the villains of Blue Sky's seventh feature film, Rio. Everyone, please welcome our cockatoo friend, Nigel, to the stand. Nigel's one of the more interesting villains in Blue Sky's catalog because he's one of the few villains to appear in more than one film. Not only that, but unlike others who fit this description, who end up becoming secondary or minor characters, Nigel remains a major character even in the sequel. Almost immediately after making his introduction, he assaults a security guard when he knocks him out and takes off with his security keys. He helps the smuggler Marcel kidnap the inhabitants of Tulio's aviary, showing that he's also not above kidnapping. Throughout the film, he attacks and recaptures both Blue and Jewel, further reinforcing his two prior offenses. In the second film, he wants revenge on Blue for ruining his life, and even stalks him all the way to the Amazons in this pursuit. This time around, Nigel doesn't stop at merely kidnapping and attacking Blue, and he wants him dead for all he's done to him. Deja vu, Blue. Showing that he will even resort to murder if necessary, or if he feels it's necessary. Of course, his plans are ultimately foiled, and he's sent back to Rio from whence he came. One of the more unique villains villains Blue Sky's given us in their films. Nigel is as ruthless as a cockatoo could probably ever be, and he's more than deserving of 50 years in prison. At the very least, that should be enough time for him to grow his hair back. Wait, how long do cockatoos live? Now let's look back at the real villain of Rio, Marcel. Nigel's owner, Marcel, is a poacher who wants to get rich by selling as many rare birds as he can. Once the plot of the film kicks in, he becomes particularly focused on kidnapping the macaws Blue and Jewel, which he does manage to do, at least for a time. This means he's one of the few villains here to actually successfully kidnap somebody, unlike others who merely attempted the act. Congrats, I guess. <laughs> yes! Finally, and rather obviously, Marcel is pretty horrible to animals. While he's not much better to his human accomplices, it's quite evident from how he acts that he sees animals as below him. It's rather fitting that Marcel, almost like a zoo animal, will be seeing 20 years in a cage. Since he's not as evil as his cockatoo sidekick, Marcel gets out of a sentence comparable to what he received. Overall, we think it's a just punishment considering how he did practically the same to so many animals. If you're enjoying the sentencing format, make sure to check out our cinema sentence 
Dancing channel. Link below. Thanks so much. Last but not least, let's take a look at Nigel's right-hand man, Mauro. The leader of a group of marmosets, Mauro's main area of expertise is theft. If you want to steal something, this is your man. He steals from tourists and later is recruited by Nigel to help find a jewel in blue. You two are coming with me. To put it short and sweet, he's an individual who's as guilty of committing theft as he is aiding and abetting. A one-note villain not unlike Fast Tony from Ice Age 2, we think Mauro deserves the same punishment he got. An entire year in prison. Why did we decide on this? Well, if we're being perfectly honest, it will not be long before Mauro gets in trouble again for stealing from another person, so why give him a long sentence when he'll only end up here once more?